It's Palm Sunday, the sixth Sunday in the 40 days of Lent, the 40 days leading up to Easter. Today's message from Pastor Tom is 40 years in the desert. It's the lessons we can learn from the end of the Israelites' 40 years in the desert and Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on what we now call Palm Sunday. Our Old Testament reading comes from Deuteronomy this morning. It was in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, that Moses spoke to the Israelites precisely what the Lord had commanded him for them. This was after the defeat of Sion, the Amorite king, who ruled in Hashbron and Og, Bashan's king, who ruled the Ashtaroth and Edari. Beyond the Jordan in the land of Moab, Moses began to explain this instruction. He said the following, At Horeb, the Lord our God told us, You've been at this mountain long enough. Get going. Enter the hills of the Amorites and the surrounding areas in the desert, the highlands, the lowlands, the arid southern region, and the seacoast, the land of the Canaanites, and the Lebanon range, all the way to the great Euphrates River. Look, I have laid the land before you. Go and possess the land that I promised to give your ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as well as to their descendants after them. God's word for God's people this day. Our reading from the New Testament this morning is from Mark, the 11th chapter, verses 1 to 11. So, when Jesus and his followers approached Jerusalem, they came to Bethpage and to Bethany at the Mount of Olives. And Jesus gave two disciples a task, saying to them, "Uh, Go into the village over there, and as soon as you enter it, you'll find tied up there a colt that no one has ridden. Untie it. Bring it here. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Say, its master needs it, and he'll send it back right away. So they went and found a colt tied to a gate just outside on the street, and so they untied it. And some people standing around said, hey, what are you doing untying the colt? And they told them, well, just what Jesus said. And then they left them alone. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes upon it, and he sat on it. And many people spread out their clothes on the road, while others spread branches cut from the fields. And those in front of him and those following were shouting, Hosanna! Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessings on the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. And then Jesus entered Jerusalem, went to the temple, and after he looked around at everything, because it was late in the evening, he returned to Bethany with the twelve. These are the words of God for the people of God. Well, we are continuing on our 40-day journey, 40-day journey of Lent, and, and we've been talking about events of 40 across the scriptures the 40 days of Jesus in the wilderness the 40 days that Noah waited for the flood to clear learning that we can rely on God the 40 days of Moses on Mount Sinai also known as Mount Horeb and we learned that scripture is a key to being able to stand difficult times we spent 40 days with Goliath taunting the Israelites, and we learn about grace being sufficient. We had 40 days of Elijah hiding out in the desert under a bush, and we found that, no, we're not alone. God is with us, and we can and we must, in fact, pass on to the next generation, our faith, that is. And then last week was the 40 days of 
Nineveh, and that when God said whosoever, he really did mean whosoever comes to him. And today we come to these two passages of Scripture, and, uh, and I hope you, you kind of caught the 40 days out of Deuteronomy, and you wonder at least a little bit of, well, what are these? what's the connection with these two passages? Well, well, we'll see. So have you ever waited for something for just a long time? Waited only to be disappointed that what you waited for didn't live up to expectations or maybe something that came entirely different from what you were expecting. And it just didn't work out. When that happens, it leads to disappointment, frustrations, and for that matter, sometimes anger. Anger. Maybe it was a long-awaited and planned-for vacation. And you get there and the room just isn't what you were expected. It, it's dirty. Or it's occupied, even worse. Or, or maybe you got there and your favorite restaurant that you've been waiting for is closed. You can't go. Or maybe the fish weren't biting or it rained all week or the wind blew so hard you couldn't even get the boat out. But you waited all winter for it. Or maybe the thing you waited for was a meeting. Maybe it was a, a meeting at the school board or a meeting of the town council, or, or maybe even a church council where you were ready to take on action on something that had been discussed over a long period of time, a change that would meet a new direction, a new hope for a better future, only to have someone or something just throw a wrench into the whole idea and the future that you were hoping for just came crashing down. That kind of disappointment. If you've ever felt like that, then maybe you have an idea of what was happening in these two passages. So before we go further, I'd like to stop and, and pray. Father, open the eyes of our hearts. Open the eyes of our hearts. We want to see you. May the words of my heart, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable to you, my rock, my redeemer, my friend. So as we start this part of the 40 days, or 40 years, let's start with the people of Israel standing on the banks of the Jordan River, getting ready to cross into the promised land. It was 40 years later. 40 years after the Israelites had stood on that very same bank. 40 years ago, they stood there expecting that God was going to make it easy. And the spies were sent into this land of promise to see what God was going to give them and they saw that it was going to be hard that it wasn't going to be easy, that they were going to have to depend and rely on God. And all except for two of them, two of them could not rely on God, would not rely on God, and could not rest on God to fulfill that promise. And God backed off and said, okay, have it your way. And they spent 40 days as nomads wandering around in the desert. And yet there are stories about how God even cared for them and carried them through those times, some very difficult times, but they could have walked into the land of promise, but God had to let it go. And they spent 40 years in the desert, and now they stand on the banks of the Jordan ready once again 
after every person over the age of 20 of all the Israelites had passed away and we've got a whole new younger generation to enter the land that God had promised all the way back to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they gathered there on the sides of the banks of the river and what they did as we saw in that passage, as they started to retell the stories of everything that had happened, from the rescue of slavery in Egypt to the Passover, when God took them out of Egypt and how they then spent 40 years in the desert, and they reminded each other of how God brought them to this very place. And in fact, you know, the retelling of those stories became a part of the Jewish heritage. They do it every year. We've sat with, have ever, any of you sat with a Jewish family for Passover and retold the story of Passover? It's a unique and it's a wonderful experience. It becomes part of the heritage where they retell the stories of, God, how, of how God rescued them. But it was more than a just living in the past and retelling the past. It was a way to bring them and think about the future that God would be promising, the promised inheritance. Do you ever tell stories like that in your families? Or retell yourself the stories from your past, the stories of how God has carried you through, carried you through hard times, carried you through good times. Carried you through times where it felt like God wasn't there paying attention. There were those times too for the Jewish people in those 40 years in the desert. But here as they stand on the banks of the Jordan, they're called to remember and retell those stories of how God was with them. And God calls us to do the very same thing. To remember, to retell the stories of what has happened to us and how God's carried us. But here they are on the banks of the Jordan River and it was a long time waiting, 40 years, waiting an entire generation to pass. And they were a nomadic people awaiting the promise to Abraham. Skip ahead, 1,500 years, 1,500 years, a very long time, for the people of Israel waiting for a Messiah to rescue them. And in that time, in those 1,400, 1,500 years, they had gone into the promised land, and for a time as the community, they did. They did live as the community of God. They lived in the way that He had taught them but it didn't last very long. They started to fall apart as a community and to take in the ways of living of those surrounding to a point where they had totally broken away, totally lost covenant, totally lost faith with the God that had brought them there. And God finally, finally separated Himself from them. In fact, one of the prophets calls it a divorce. But in our terms, it's probably a little bit more like a legal separation where he separated himself with the expectation and the hope and the promise that they would one day be reunited. And that's what the prophets wrote about. Is a Messiah that would come to bring them back and rescue them with a restored relationship and promise of the covenant that goes all the way back to Abraham and many many thought that's what was happening as they watched and they saw Jesus of Nazareth ministering and walking around and proclaiming the coming kingdom in Galilee after all he said he was the son of God after all he said the kingdom of God is near at hand And they had seen or heard miracles, healing, feeding of the 5,000, all of those things. And here it was, Passover time. 
Passover time. And one of the things that would happen at Passover time is people would take the pilgrimage and go to Jerusalem to worship at the temple where the presence of God would be. And people from all over the world would travel there to Jerusalem. And Jesus and his disciples were right along with them. The roads that they were traveling on would have been the same. There would have been a lot of people on the road. And word that Jesus himself was on the road to Jerusalem would have spread would have spread through all those pilgrims that are on the road. And the excitement, the expectation that maybe, maybe Jesus of Nazareth would be the one. The one. Of course, they would know the history. They would know not only the history of what we know in the Old Testament, they would know just 200 years before a hero, Judas Maccabees, came in and he drove out the Syrian king, Antiochus, the Syrian king that had put the statue of Zeus in the temple itself, and he drove them out. And when he drove them out and he was victorious, do you know what the people did? They waved palm branches. They waved palm branches. And boy, oh boy, does that sound familiar? But he was not the one. The pilgrims along the road would remember these other so-called messiahs in the same time that promised deliverance from the Roman intruders, that promised that they would kick out these invaders that had taken over the promised land of Israel and every one of them were killed. Then there was the Jewish elite, the ruling elite at that. And they were known as the Sanhedrin. They were looking and plotting for a way that they could take over from the Romans, that that they themselves would be in charge, that they wouldn't stand, they wouldn't stand for any upstart messiahs who would push them out of their campaign for power, especially someone from Nazareth and in the midst of all that here comes Jesus who had been preaching all along here comes the kingdom of God the crowd was on a pilgrimage on the road to Galilee and that road would have taken them through Jericho Jericho that's 800 feet below sea level the road take them up the side of the mountain to 3,000 feet above sea level. They would have made that climb of nearly 4,000 feet to Bethany. And have you ever been on a hike like that? You've been to the Grand Canyon where you go down deep and you go down and as you're coming back up and you get tired, right? And as you get tired though, it gets pretty exciting as you come towards the top and you know you're going to get to the top. But what they got to do is they come up to the top to the crest of the hill and as they look out, the whole valley spreads out in front of them and they can see Jerusalem there just two and a half miles in the distance and the glory of the temple would be standing out where they could see that. Can you see the excitement build as this crowd is coming up and they think they have the Messiah with them? It's just absolutely ready to explode. They knew they were, well, at least they thought, they were welcoming a king. In that circumstance, and the way that goes, what do you think they might be thinking? What do you think they'd be expecting? And they sing, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And how does Jesus enter the city? On a donkey. A young donkey at that, the colt of a donkey. They shouted, singing, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they waved palm branches. They lined the streets with their cloaks. They were expecting a conquering king just like they did with Judas Maccabees. Maybe, 
Maybe they didn't even realize that that chant, the Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he, that's actually from the prophet Zechariah. Zechariah chapter 9, you can read it in there in verses 9 and 10. It was an announcement that the king has come. It even says that he's going to ride on a donkey, the offspring, a colt, the offspring of a donkey. And Jesus himself picked a colt to ride on. It certainly fulfills a prophecy from Zechariah. But it also announces, I'm not the kind of king you're expecting. See, a conquering king in that time, in the time of the Romans, would come in on a war horse. He'd come in on a stallion. Coming in on a donkey. A young one at that would announce that this person coming in is coming in peace. There would be no war. Now, if the people knew or if they read Zechariah carefully, they would also recognize that the king riding on the donkey was actually an announcement that the war was over. It was done. It was finished. But nevertheless, nevertheless, the crowds welcomed Jesus. It's what we call Palm Sunday. And with all of those things swirling around, it was a perfect storm. Perfect storm. Now, we in Oklahoma know something about perfect storms, don't we? We know what happens when weather systems come and they collide. I remember the time there and more just a few years ago when two storm cells came and merged and collided together and that massive tornado was spawned. But there was another time. You know my penchant for movies. There was a movie that was made about a real perfect storm that hit the fishing boat, the Andrea Gale, out there in the Atlantic Ocean and turned it into a bunch of matchsticks, and the crew was lost. But what happened was that there was a powerful cold front that came in from the west, and a high pressure system that was coming down from the north, and a hurricane that came up from the south. And they all collided there in the North Atlantic, right over the spot where the Andrea Gale was, and everyone was lost. Here on this Palm Sunday, what happened there in Jerusalem, the Roman occupiers who kept their armies in place to keep control of this critical town on the trade routes of the Roman Empire, well, they were there from the West. And the Jewish ruling party who was actively looking for a way to gain their own power came in from the south. Then Jesus and the band of people who came with them from the north announcing the kingdom of God. And it all happened at a time when hundreds of thousands of people from all over the world crowded into the city multiplying its population hundreds of times to remember the rescue from the oppressors of Egypt, the annual festival that recalls a rescue from an oppressive kingdom. It was a pot ready to boil over. But Jesus, or Jesus rode in on a colt, a colt. And yes, the chant from the people Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They did get it right. The king had come, but he was not that kind of king. He was a king coming of pe in peace, saying that his kingdom is not of this world. It had nothing to do with political power. It was and is a kingdom of the heart. A kingdom that would last all other kingdoms 
a kingdom of a new creation. And what that presents for us, a kingdom of a new creation in the midst of this Palm Sunday, is a challenge. See, it's a question for all of us. And the question is, knowing all of these things, are you ready to follow Jesus? No matter what our surrounding culture might say, after all, even today, some of the followers of God say we should have control of the culture around us, just like the Sadducees and Sanhedrin did back then. See, are we ready to follow Jesus no matter what our hearts might desire, want? So even if God does not deliver what we want, will we still follow Him just because He's King? Why? Why? Because regardless of what we think we need or want, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, has only our best at heart. For none of us, we cannot see all things. We cannot see all futures that actually do lead to resurrection. Not only the resurrection of Jesus, but the resurrection of us. And all of that leading to new creation. It was only a week after this parade, the waving of palm branches announcing the coming of the king when the darkest of all hours would come. And the day that changes everything would break through. But today, today on this Palm Sunday, the day of a parade that announced Jesus as the king, king of a kingdom of the heart, that would change the world, the question really is this. Will you this day, in each day, pray this simple prayer? Teach me, Lord Jesus, to humbly follow you, to hear your voice and follow you no matter what the world around me might do. No matter what I might want, no matter what my own desire might be, teach me, Lord Jesus, to humbly follow you. Amen.